Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. Spirit. Spirit that is certain of itself. Morality. The ethical world showed, in its, showed its faith and its truth to be the spirit that had merely passed away in it, the individual self. This legal person, however, has its substance and fulfilment outside of that world. The movement of the world of culture and faith uh, does away with this abstraction of the person, and through the completed alienation, uh, through the ultimate abstraction, the substance becomes the four spirit at first, uh, the universal will, and finally the spirit's own possession. Here then, knowledge appears at last to have become completely identical with its truth, for its truth is this very knowledge, and any antithesis between the two sides has vanished. Vanished not only for us, or in itself, but for self-consciousness itself. In other words, self-consciousness has gained the mastery over the antithesis uh, within consciousness itself. Uh, this antithesis rests on the antithesis of the certainty of self and of the object. Now, however, the object is for consciousness itself, the certainty of itself, namely knowledge, just as the certainty of itself as such no longer has ends of its own, is therefore no longer contained within a determinateness, but is pure knowledge. Thus for self-consciousness, its knowledge is the substance itself, this substance is for it just as immediate as it's absolutely mediated as it is absolutely mediated in an indi indivisible unity. It is immediate, like the ethical consciousness which knows its a duty and does it, and is bound up with it as with its own nature. But it is not character, as that ethical consciousness is, which on account of its immediacy is a specifically determined spirit, belongs only to one of the ethical essentialities and has the characteristics of, has the characteristic of not knowing. It is absolute mediation like the consciousness which cultivates itself and the consciousness which believes, for it is essentially the movement of the self, to set aside the abstraction of immediate existence and to become conscious of itself as a universal. And yet to do so, neither by the pure alienation and disruption of itself and of actuality, nor by fleeing from it, rather it is immediately present to itself in its, in, in its substance. Uh, for this is its knowledge, is the intuited pure certainty of itself, and just this immediacy, which is its own reality, is all reality for the immediate is being itself, and as pure immediacy, purified by absolute negativity, it is being in general or all being. Absolute essential being is therefore not exhausted when determined as the simple essence of thought. It is all reality, and this reality is only as knowledge. What consciousness did not know would have no significance for consciousness and can have no power over it. Into its conscious will, all objectivity, the whole world has withdrawn. It is absolutely free in that it knows its freedom, and just as knowledge is its substance and purpose and its sole content. <sighs> the moral view of the world. Self-consciousness knows duty to be the absolute essence. It is bound only by duty. And this substance is its own pure consciousness for which duty cannot receive the form of something alien However, as thus locked up, locked up within itself, moral self-consciousness is not yet posited and considered as consciousness. The object is immediate knowledge, and being thus permeated purely by the self is not an object. But because self-consciousness is essentially a mediation and negativity, its notion implies relation to anotherness and thus is consciousness. This otherness, because duty constitutes the soul's aim and uh, object of consciousness, is on the one hand a reality completely without significance for consciousness, but because this consciousness is so completely locked up within itself, it behaves with perfect freedom and indifference uh, towards this, the, this otherness. And therefore, the existence of this otherness, on the other hand, is left completely free by self-consciousness as existence that similarly is related only to itself. 
The fear self consciousness becomes the fear also is the negative object of its consciousness. The object has thus become a complete world within itself with an individuality of its own, a self subsistent whole of laws peculiar to itself, as well as an independent operation of those laws, and a free realization of them. In general, a nature whose law laws like its actions belong to itself as a being which is indifferent to moral self consciousness, just as the latter is indifferent to it. From this determination is developed a moral view of the world, which consists in the relation between the absoluteness of morality and the absoluteness of nature. The, this relation is based on the one hand on the complete indifference and independence of nature towards moral purposes and activity, and on the other hand on the consciousness of duty alone as the essential fact, and of nature as completely devoid of independence and essential being. The moral view of the world contains the development of the moments which are present in this relation of such completely conflicting presuppositions. To begin with then, the moral consciousness as such is presupposed. Duty is the essence for this consciousness which is actual and active, and in its actuality and, and action fulfills its duty. But this moral consciousness is at the same time faced with the presupposed freedom of nature. In other words, it learns from experience that nature is not concerned with giving the moral consciousness a sense of the unity of its reality with that of nature. And hence that nature perhaps may uh, let it become happy or perhaps may not. Uh, the non-moral consciousness, on the other hand, uh, finds perhaps by chance its uh, realisation where the moral consciousness sees only an occasion for acting, but does not see itself obtaining through its action, the happiness of performance and the enjoyment of achievement. And therefore it finds rather cause for complaint about such a state of incompatibility between itself and existence and about the injustice which restricts it to having its object merely as a pure duty, uh, but refuses to let it be, let it see the object and itself realised. The moral consciousness cannot forego happiness and leave this element out of its absolute purpose. The purpose which it expressed as pure duty essentially implies the individual self-consciousness, individual conviction and the knowledge of it, uh, constitute an absolute element in morality. This element in the objectified purpose, in the fulfilled duty, is the individual consciousness that beholds itself as realised. In other words, it is enjoyment, which is thus implied in the notion of morality, not indeed immediately in mor morality regarded as sentiment or uh, disposition, but only in the notion of its actualization. Uh, this, however, means that enjoyment is also implied in morality as disposition, for this does not remain disposition in contrast to action, but proceeds to act or to realise itself. Uh, thus the purpose expressed as the whole with the consciousness of its moment, of its moments is that the fulfilled duty is just as much a moral action as a realised individuality, and that nature, the aspect of individuality, in contrast to the abstract purpose, is one with this purpose, necessary as the experience of the disharmony of the two sides, because nature is uh, free. Even so, what is essential is duty alone, and nature contrasted with it is devoid of a self. Uh, that purpose in its entirety, which the harmony of the two constitutes, contains, contains within it actuality itself. It is at the same time the thought of actuality, the harmony of morality and nature, or since nature comes into account only insofar as consciousness experiences its unity with, its harm, with it, the harmony of morality and happiness, is thought of as something that necessarily is, that is, it is uh, postulated. For to say that something is um, demanded, it means that something is thought of in the form of being that's not yet actual, a necessity not of the notion, qua notion, but of being. But necessity is at the same time essentially relation uh, based on the notion. The being that is demanded then is not the imagined being of a contingent consciousness, but is implied in the notion of morality itself, whose true content is the unity of the pure and the individual consciousness. It is for the latter to see that this unity be for it an actuality in the content of the purpose, this is happiness, but in its form is existence in general. The existence thus demanded, that is, the unity of both, is therefore not a wish nor regarded as purpose. One whose attainment were still uncertain, it is rather a demand of reason and an immediate certainty and presupposition of reason. That first experience and this postulate are not the same, the same I should say, are not the same postulates, but a whole circle of postulates open, up, open, up, opens up. Uh, nature, that is to say, is not merely this wholly free external mode of being in which, as a pure object, 
consciousness has to re realize its purpose. This consciousness is in its own self essentially one for which this other free actual existence is, that is, for it is for it is itself a contingent and natural existence. This nature, which is for consciousness its own nature, is sensuousness, which in the shape of volition, as instincts and inclinations, possesses a specific essentiality of its own or has its own individual purposes, and thus is opposed to the pure will and its pure purpose. However, in contrast with this opposition, pure consciousness has rather the relation of sensuousness to it, the absolute unity of the latter with it, uh, for its essence, for for its essence, I should say, both of these, pure thought and the sensuous aspect of consciousness are in themselves a single consciousness, and it is precisely pure thought for which and in which this pure unity is, but qua consciousness, what is explicit for it is the antithesis of itself and impulses and instincts. In this conflict between reason and sensuousness, the essential thing for reason is that the conflict be resolved, the result being the emergence of the unity of both, a unity which is not the former, original, uh, that is, immediate unity of both in a single individual, but a unity which proceeds from the known antithesis of both. Only such a unity is its is actual morality, for in it it is contained the antithesis whereby the self is consciousness, or first is an actual self in fact, and at the same time a universal. In other words, in that unity there is expressed that mediation which, as we see, is essential to morality, since of the two moments of the antithesis, sensuousness is sheer otherness, or the negative, while on the other hand the pure thought of duty is the essence, no element of which can be given up, it seems that the resultant unity can only be brought about by getting rid of sensuousness. But since sensuousness is itself a moment of the process producing the unity, namely the moment of actuality, we have to be content in the first instance with expressing the unity by saying that sensuousness should be in conformity with morality. This unity is likewise a postulated being. It is not actually there. For what if there is consciousness? or the antithesis of, of sensuousness and pure consciousness. For what, I should, say, I should say, for what is there is consciousness, or the antithesis of sensuousness and pure consciousness. But, at the same time, the unity is not an in itself or merely implicit, uh, like the first postulate, in which the free nature constitutes an element of the unity, and in consequence, the harmony of nature with the moral consciousness falls outside of the latter. On the contrary, nature here is that which is an element of consciousness itself, and we have here to deal with morality as such, with the morality that is the active self's very own. Consciousness has, therefore, itself to bring about this harmony and continue to be making progress in morality, but the, consummate, the consummation of this progress has to be projected into a future infinitely remote. For if it actually came about, this would do away with the moral consciousness, for morality is only moral consciousness as negative essence, for whose pure duty and sensuousness has only a negative significance, is only not in conformity with duty. But in that harmony, morality and qua consciousness, that is, its actuality, vanishes, just as in the moral consciousness, or in the actuality of morality, the harmony vanishes. The consummation, therefore, cannot be attained, but is to be thought of merely as an absolute task, that is, one which simply remains a task. Yet at the same time, its content has to be thought of as something which simply must be, and must not remain a task. Whether we imagine the moral consciousness to be altogether done away with its goal or not, which of these really is the case can no longer clearly be determined in the dim remoteness of infinity, to which for that very reason the attainment of the goal is postponed. Strictly speaking, we shall have to say that a definite idea on this point ought not to, be in, not to, be, not to interest us. And ought not to be looked for, because it leads to contradiction. The contradiction of a task which is to remain a task and yet thought of, and yet thought to be, ought, to be, ought to be fulfilled, and the contradiction of a morality which is no longer to be, a moral consciousness, i.e., not actual, not actual. However, 
The idea that a perfect morality would involve a contradiction would do harm to the sanctity of the very essence of morality and absolute duty would appear as something unreal. The first postulate was the harmony of morality and objective nature, the final purpose of the world. The other, the harmony of morality and the sensuous will, the final purpose of self-consciousness as such. The first then is harmony in the form of an implicit being, and the other in the form of being for self. But what connects as middle term these postulated two extreme final purposes is the movement of actual conduct itself. There are harmonies whose moments in their abstract distinctiveness have not yet developed into objects for consciousness. Uh, this occurs in the actuality in which societies appear in consciousness proper, each as the other of the other. The postulates arising from this now contain the harmonies both in and for themselves, whereas previously they were postulated only as separate, one being in itself or implicit, and the other being for itself or explicit. The moral consciousness, as the simple knowing and willing of pure duty, is in the doing of it uh, brought into relation with the object which stands in contrast to its simplicity, into relation with, with, that act, with the actuality of the, complete, of the complex case, and thereby has a complex moral relationship with it. Here arise, in relation to content, the many laws generally and in relation to form, the contradictory powers of the knowing consciousness and of the non-conscious. The non in the first place, as regards the many duties, the moral consciousness is gen in general heeds only the pure duty in them. The many duties qua manifold are specific and therefore as such have nothing sacred about them for the moral consciousness. At the same time, however, being necessary, since the notion of doing implies a complex actuality and therefore a complex moral relation to it, uh, these many duties must be regarded as possessing an intrinsic being of their own. Further, since they can exist only in a moral consciousness, they exist at the same time in another consciousness than that for which only pure duty qua pure duty possesses an intrinsic being of its own and is sacred. Thus, the, it is postulated that it is another consciousness which makes them sacred, or which knows and wills them as duties. The first holds to pure duty, indifferent to all specific content, and duty is only this indifference towards such content. Uh, the other, however, contains the equally essential relation to doing, and to the necessity of the specific content. Uh, since for this other, uh, duties means specific duties, the content as such is equally essential to, as the form which made the content a duty. Uh, this consciousness is consequently one in which the uh, one in which universal and particular are simply one, and its notion is therefore the same as the notion of the harmony of morality and happiness. For this antithesis equally expresses the separation of the self, equal moral consciousness from that actuality which, as manifold, manifold being, conflicts with the simple essential nature of duty. While, however, the first postulate expresses the harmony of morality and nature as a harmony that simply is, because in its nature is this negative aspect of self-consciousness, is the moment of being, this implicit harmony, on the other hand, is now essentially posited as a consciousness. Uh, for what simply is, now has the form of the content of a duty, or as a determinateness in the determinate duty. The implicit harmony is thus the unity of what are simply, or what are simple essentialities, essentialities of thought, and are therefore only in a consciousness. This is then henceforth a ma master and ruler of the world, who brings about the harmony of morality and happiness, and at the same time sanctifies duties in their multiplicity. This last means this much, that for the consciousness of pure duty, the determinate or specific duty cannot straight away be sacred, but because the specific duty on account of the actual doing, which is a specific action, is likewise necessary, its, necess its necessity falls outside of that consciousness into another consciousness, which thus mediates or brings together the specific and the pure a duty, and is the reason why the former also has validity. In the actual doing, however, consciousness behaves as this particular self, as completely individual. It is directed toward reality as such, and has this for its purpose, for it wills to achieve not something. A duty, in general, thus falls outside of it into another being, which is consciousness, and the sacred lawgiver of pure duty, for the consciousness which acts, and just because it acts, the validity of the other consciousness, that of pure duty, is directly acknowledged. This pure duty is thus the content of another consciousness, and is sacred for the consciousness that acts only immediately, namely through the agency of this other consciousness. 
Because it is in this way positive that the validation of duty as something absolutely sacred falls outside the actual consciousness, this latter accordingly stands altogether on one side as the imperfect moral consciousness, just as in regard to its knowledge it knows itself then as consciousness whose knowledge and conviction are imperfect and contingent. Similarly, in regard to its willing, it knows itself as a consciousness whose purposes are affected with sensuousness. On account of its unworthiness, therefore, it cannot look on happiness as necessary, but as something contingent, and can expect it only as a gift of grace. In this, the moral view of the world is completed. For in the notion of the moral self-consciousness, the two aspects, pure duty and actuality, are explicitly joined in a single unity, and consequently the one, like the other, is expressly without a being of its own, but is only a moment, or is superseded. This becomes explicit for consciousness in the last phase of the moral view of the world, that is to say, it places pure duty in a being other than itself, that is, it posits pure duty partly as something existing only in thought, partly as something that is not valid in and for itself, rather it is the non-moral consciousness that is held to be perfect. Equally, it gives itself the character of a consciousness whose actuality, not being in conformity with duty, is superseded and qua superseded, or in the idea of absolute being, no longer contradicts morality. For the moral consciousness itself, however, its moral view of the world does not mean that consciousness develops there in its own notion and makes this its object. It is not conscious of this antithesis either as regards the form or the content. It does not relate or comp compare the sides of this antithesis with one another, but in its development rolls onward without being the notion which holds uh, the moments together. For it knows only the pure essence or the object so far as it is duty, so far as it is an abstract object of its pure consciousness as a pure knowing or as its own self. It thinks therefore only an abstraction and does not comprehend. That is in terms of the notion. Consequently, the object of its actual consciousness is not yet a transparent to it. It is not the absolute notion, which alone grasps otherness as such, or its absolute opposite, as its own self. It does indeed hold its own reality, like all objective reality, to be unessential. But its freedom is the freedom of pure thought, in contrast to which, therefore, nature likewise has a vision as an existence that is equally free. Because both are equally present in it, that is, the freedom of mere being, and the inclusion of this being within consciousness, its object becomes one that has being, but at the same time there exists only at the same time exists only a thought. In the last stage of the moral view of the world, uh, the content is explicitly such that its being is given to it by thought, and this conjunction of being and thought is pronounced to be what in fact it is imagining. When we consider the moral view of the world in such a way that this objective mode is nothing else than the very notion of moral self-consciousness which it makes objective to itself, then this awareness of the form of its origin gives rise to its exposition in another shape. The first stage which forms the starting point is the actual moral self-consciousness or the fact that there is such a moral self-consciousness. For the notion gives it this explicit character uh, viz that all reality in general, has essential being for it only, only, so, only so far as it is in conformity with duty. And this essential being it characterizes as no knowledge, that is, as in immediate unity with the actual self. Hence this unity is itself actual, it is a moral actual consciousness. And this now, qua consciousness, pictures its content to itself as an object, namely, as the final purpose of the world, as harmony of morality and all reality. But since it thinks of this unity as object, and is not the notion, which has mastery over the object as such, the unity is a negative of self-consciousness. For it, consciousness for it, or it falls outside of it as something beyond its actual existence, and yet at the same time is something that also has being, but a being existing only in thought. This self-consciousness, which qua self-consciousness is other than the object, is thus left with the lack of harmony between the consciousness of duty and reality, and that too its own reality. Accordingly, the proposition now runs as follows. There is no moral perfect actual self-consciousness, and since the moral sphere is at all only insofar as it is perfect, for duty is the pure unadulterated intrinsic being, or in itself, and morality consists only in conformity to this pure in itself. The second proposition 
simply runs there is no moral existence in reality. Since, however, in the third place, it is a single self, it is in itself or implicitly the unity of duty and morality, the unity of duty and morality. This unity, therefore, becomes an object for it as perfect morality, but as a beyond of its reality, yet a beyond that ought to be actual. In this goal of the synthetic unity of the first two propositions, the self-conscious reality, that is actual self-consciousness, as well as duty, is posited as only a superseded moment, for neither of these two is single and separate. On the contrary, each of them, whose essential determination lies in their being free from one another, is thus in the unity no longer free from the other, and each therefore is superseded. Hence, as regards content, they become as such objects, each of which counts, as objects for the other, and as regards form, in such a way that this interchange is at the same time only imagined. That is, occurs only in thought, or again, the actually non-moral sphere, because it is equally pure thought, and is raised above its actual existence, is yet in imagination moral, and is taken to be completely valid. In this way, the first proposition, that there is a moral self-consciousness, is reinstated, but is bound up with the second, that there is none, that is, that there is one, but only in imagination, or, in other words, it is true that there is none, yet all the same, it is allowed by another consciousness uh, to pass for one. Correggio Allegory of Virtue which as you can see was unfinished but the fact that virtue is looking like such a ghostly figure I think it gives it sort of more effective really that's my opinion anyway because morality is a bit of a ghostly figure for me I confess anyway thank you for listening